Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion. It is being live streamed. I'm Monita Rajpal. This conversation is also being recorded, and you'll be able to enjoy it at a time uh, that is convenient for you. Please also do join us in this conversation by sending us your questions, uh, which we will hopefully be able to read out and engage our panel discussion, uh, our panelists uh, in this conversation as well. But for now, again, I'm Monita Rajpal. I welcome you all to this live stream. On August 26, 2019, heads of state attending the G7 summit in Biarritz, France, heard a call to action. It was uh, from the leaders of a major global industry announcing a promise. They made a pact to work together towards concrete and specific goals when it comes to reducing the impact that their industry was having on our planet. They made a promise to do what they could to reduce the harm that was being done to our planet. The areas they focused on was climate change, biodiversity, and oceans. But in 2019, the world was a very different place. 2020 has seen the world shut down. Now for some, it was a blessing in disguise. It was time to be still, reflect, and to stop. And we saw the impact of that stillness on our planet, the world around us, and the environment with clear skies, with animals emerging out into the open, sensing this peace that perhaps had been missing throughout the age of the Anthropocene. But for many others, 2020 has been a curse, losing livelihoods, losing the loves of their lives in a battle no one was prepared for. Over a million people to date have so far died with COVID, have died from COVID related illnesses around the world. And that number continues to rise every day. What has become blatantly clear in this year is that who we are, what we do, how we act, where we live, how we live, how we earn, how we treat each other and the planet, it's all interconnected. So as we look at this progress report from the Fashion Pact, we do so with an understanding that 2020 is a game changer because it has to be. Our panel today consists of four esteemed leaders who are speaking not as a voice for their companies, but, as, but they are representing the 62 signatories who are part of this Fashion Pact, a collective voice by CEOs for CEOs. Before I introduce you to them officially and welcome them officially, take a look at this video. The fashion industry is one of the most polluting industries in the world. There has been a lot of talk, but I think now is the time to uh, take into account really the impact and the need for sustainability in our society today. We join the Fashion Pact as it is our strong belief that the collective action is much more powerful than the action of each single individually. That's why in a team sport, you achieve much better results. The Fashion Pact is breaking down barriers of competition and bringing together companies, distributors, and suppliers to work together toward clear common goals. CEO to CEO, principles to principles, to take tough decisions and fast decisions to make sure things are moving forward more rapidly. It has been able to gather industry leaders to actually make fashion differently. The beneficiaries are therefore all living beings and the planet itself with maximum benefit to each. I'd say solidarity. Cooperation. Impact us. Essential. Focus. The power of all. The action. It's really now time for action. Together, let's make every act count. Join us 
Joining me today is Sonia Singal, Chief Executive Officer of GAP Inc., Manny Chirico, Chairman and CEO of PVH Group, its owner uh, of iconic brands such as uh, Tommy Hilfiger and Calvin Klein, Bruna Pavlovsky, the President of Chanel SAS and President of Chanel Fashion, and Paul Pullman, the co-founder and chair of Imagine, a for-benefit organization and foundation. It's a, a new type of business collaboration working with CEOs to help business leaders create the world we all want. I'd like to welcome all of you today. Paul, I'd like to begin with you. You have said before that what is really needed today is courageous business leaders taking action. That couldn't ring truer today. Um, since the creation of the Fashion Pact, what do you believe has been accomplished and how do you measure that accomplishment based on the events around the world today? Well, thank you, Anita, and welcome to my fellow panel members, uh, Bruno, uh, Manny, and uh, Sonia. It's an honor to be here. What is very clear is that COVID has shown us that we cannot have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. And the relationships between climate change, biodiversity, human health, now also a racial dimension, the economy are increasingly being clear. And what this is really is uh, that the private sector has to step up to ensure that we come out of COVID better than what we went in. 90% of the people of this world don't want to move back to the world that we came from, but want to create a greener, more sustainable, more equitable environment. The reality is that CEOs themselves and their companies can only do so much for which they are held accountable, but collectively they can do much more. So the Fashion Pact is a collective of courageous CEOs that have come together across the value chain to um, work on areas to create tipping points beyond existing initiatives. When they're together, they become more courageous and we see bigger initiatives. In this case, around the areas, as you mentioned, of biodiversity, of climate, and of oceans. And what we have uh, achieved is an industry that was relatively independent, has now a coalition of 62 companies. 80% have now made commitments on biodiversity. 40% is already working on science-based targets. And when it gets to plastics, everybody has accelerated their commitments in the last year. So it is these type of coalitions that keep us more ambitious and keep us uh, uh, driving forward at the scale and speed that is needed. And this is achieved within the last 12 months, as you rightfully pointed out, despite COVID. Well, let's go deeper now into those uh, three pillars. You know, when it comes to climate change in a report co-sponsored and co-authored by the Global Fashion Agenda, which was released in August of this year, um, it said that, and I'm quoting here, that the fashion sector was responsible for some 2.1 billion metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions in 2018. That's about 4% of the global total. Uh, and they put this in context and they say that the fashion industry emits about the same quantity of GHGs per year as the entire economies of France, Germany, and the United Kingdom combined. Um, now, in order to meet the target of keeping global rising temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, this report indicates, says that the industry would need to cut its GHG emissions by 1.1 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide in less than a decade now. So, Manny, let me ask you, what has the, the Fashion Pact already done to begin offsetting this fast approaching and already evidentiary existence of our Earth's limitations. Thank you, Manita. Um, in recognition of the urgent need to reduce emissions as an industry overall, the pact has established three action items. Action item number one is an alignment with the existing UN Fashion Charter on climate change, which sets the bar for driving corporate actions that are consistent with achieving net zero emissions by 2050 through the implementation of science-based targets and also reducing emissions by 30%. Action item number two is achieving 25% sourcing of low impact raw materials by 2025. And action item number three is, of, is achieving a 50% 
uh, use of renewable energy by 2025 across all of our operations and 100% by 2030. In order to deliver on these targets, the Fashion Pact is engaging with key experts in the area, in the industry, including the consulting firms uh, System IQ and 2050, who've mapped out strategic areas for our collective efforts and will provide us with assistance in the accurate reporting of our results and target setting. So far, within most uh, companies, significant individual action is already underway to reduce greenhouse emissions. Members achieve significant progress towards the transition to lower climate impact raw materials, specifically a 40% in cotton, as well as targets that are set up that a third of our companies are on track to achieve 50% renewable energy in 2020. It's the early stages of our efforts, but I think we're off to a very good start so far. Now, in a report released today, um, one fifth of the world's countries are at risk of their ecosystems collapsing uh, due to a decline in biodiversity. And also a UN report that was released uh, earlier this year, that was published in May, uh, found that around a million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction many within decades. Um, we understand though that the loss of biodiversity is not only an environmental issue, it is a developmental, economic, societal security and moral issue as well. So uh, Bruno, when it comes to biodiversity, what has the Fashion Pact been doing there? Thank you, Monita. Hello, everybody. Um, just uh, before going to uh, biodiversity, I, I would like to uh, some remarks. The first, the first one is about the fashion pact. I have had a lot of questions about uh, how do that possible, you know, to have uh, the 60 companies, companies sorry, who are uh, sometimes competitors working uh, together. And I think that the topics we're addressing with the fashion pact uh, through uh, biodiversity, but through all the topics is much larger than the competition. Here we are talking at the early beginning of the chain, when uh, the competition is less and when we need to make the changes happen. So first one, no competition, only focus on the key topics. Second one, I heard a lot about compensation. We are not talking here about only about compensation. We are talking on very concrete action plan. And I will take an example with Cotton, just to twilight how we can work together on these topics and try to make things change. Uh, here, we are talking about very concrete action to, to change the planet. The third one, uh, for all of us and for everyone, it's a new uh, responsibility. When I take the example of Chanel, uh, we uh, want to be the ultimate luxury. Uh, we want to um, represent the excellence of tomorrow. Uh, we are working on creation. We are working of, on uh, craftsmanship, know-how. And we need also to work with the best uh, raw materials. It's not only the best quality, but the best way to, to find these raw materials and to ensure that the way to cultivate them, to create them, is clean, if I may say, with uh, the planet of today. And that's something very concrete that we need uh, to tackle. My example, the cotton, you mentioned uh, many, uh, a few figures. It's about 40% of uh, all the materials used by the signatories of the Fashion Pact. It's about one third of the cotton used in the fashion market. So uh, it's very clear, it was a, a fundamental element we need to improve if we want to cover the topics of uh, biodiversity. When we talk about cotton, we talk about three major risks. One is obviously the labor condition, one is the water consumption, and the third one is the chemical usage. If we want to provide a change, if we want to make things happen, we cannot stay at this level isolated. We have to work together with the best experts, and one of the contributions of the Fashion Pact, obviously, is to bring at the table the best experts to understand, you know, all together which are the right uh, challenges and, and uh, improve the different level of certification that you can uh, find on the cottons. And here, we need not only uh, to have all these participants, but to convince them uh, to become uh, quite active uh, in the change. 
For Chanel, for example, we have decided to focus on the regenerative organic certified cotton because we have found there the best balance between uh, uh, what we need in terms of brand and the changes that we want to apply. I think it's a very good example to try to convince all the others to do the same at their level, at their speed, with their choice. Uh, for me, uh, in, in these topics, uh, the fashion pack, it's an accelerator. On top of cottons, we have been able to talk on many uh, different uh, materials, and, and there is a long list. We need to focus and we need to improve, and that's the job at my level of, of the fashion pact. Now, when it comes to oceans, Sir David Attenborough has said that the world's oceans are turning into a toxic soup of industrial waste and plastic, and it has been reported that textiles are among the largest sources of both primary and secondary um, uh, waste in our oceans. With that, Sonia, I'd like to ask you, how has the Fashion Pact identified and uh, progressed on targets uh, that are crucial to not just cleaning up the messes that's already been made, but not adding to the, the mess that's in our oceans right now? Thank you, Manita. And let me start by acknowledging, you know, this is a big challenge. And part of the the benefit of the Fashion Pact is facing some of these big challenges head on with transparency. So let's start by stating the problem. You know, we know that there's unnecessary and problematic plastics that pollute the oceans, damage our ecosystems, affect our food, water supply, and even impact the air that we breathe. And so in order to protect our oceans, you know, our big systems change is required. And this is, as others have said, you know, we realize we're all connected in this and we must take bold collective action as an industry to address this microfiber pollution and other impacts that the apparel industry has that directly affect our ocean. None of us, no matter our size, can solve this alone because we're all connected on one planet. So what the pact has done, you know, to start, we've identified two uh, key action items uh, for the ocean pillar. The first is to eliminate the unnecessary and problematic plastics. And the second is to use only 100% of recycled plastic by 2030. And as we shared in the report published today, so far 60% of the signatory brands have eliminated plastic packaging in their retail bags. And while signatories continue to work through the challenges in hangers and business to business transport bags, to date, Oh, I'm really proud to say that 15% of our signatories have achieved elimination of unnecessary plastics. So in our first year, that's fairly sizable uh, progress and we intend to continue to publish these kinds of numbers in our reporting go forward. And you know, I can speak for my own company that uh, scales with a lot, of, um, a lot of our product around the world. And, and for us, putting our, uh, our arms around the actual impact, the actual numbers was the first step and then in the first year to get to that double digit elimination, it feels like progress, yet we have a long, a long way to go. Now, Maddie, you've said uh, throughout your leadership that you are committed to and focusing on science-based targets. How then do you measure any success that has come, uh, come your way and within the fashion pact itself? You know, I think um, given my background, I'm a, I'm, I'm a financial, an operational background. To me, everything needs to be measured if you're going to have success. And I think it's critical uh, and an essential part of demonstrating that we are serious about what we're undertaking. And this is not just public relations, uh, that we're setting targets that are based on science and that we're holding ourselves accountable to deliver against those targets. It's also critical that those targets are, well, Paul Pullman likes to use the word courageous, that we are stretching ourselves on those targets and keep moving forward to try and achieve those or exceed those targets as we go forward. And it, it's critical that we report our, the status of how we're doing against those targets continually as we go forward to see, are we achieving? Are we improving? Are we moving, the, are we raising the bar? for our industry and for the pack that we're working to together. So I think it really needs to be tangible, results-oriented targets that we, we establish, and then having a reporting framework that's consistent 
throughout the industry and consistent how we measure uh, that pulls it all together and allows us to, to uh, report our results in a way that's clear to the consumer, clear to our, all of our stakeholders as we go forward, and that we're holding ourselves accountable to all those stakeholders as we go forward. The thing is, with every and any endeavor, um, there will always be challenges because if it was easy, we will ask ourselves, why didn't we do it before? Um, this year has certainly tested us all, but goals that were set last year were done so uh, based on science and they still need to be met. Sonia, um, you had said before, just uh, early, you said that just putting your arms around the numbers was uh, a feat in itself because it is quite staggering just to simply understand uh, what's at stake here. What have been the hurdles, do you think, Sonia, uh, towards progress, and what do you anticipate those to be in the future? You know, this year has been such a, a year unlike any other, Monita, and I think we've all realized not only um, the impact that we all have on the planet, which we had, we, which we had acknowledged through the, through the origination of the pact a year ago, but truly the impact of the fashion families around the world. And you know, as we've all lived with the COVID um, crisis, you know, I think that really was what crystallized for me and for um, for many of us in this industry. When you think about how many families this industry uh, supports, and you know, if I think about my company alone, uh, the, between our own employees, but also all of the women that work in our factories, all of the cotton farmers, all of the uh, people that do transportation, it's millions, you know, we, we tally in the couple of millions. And when you add up all the companies in fashion, the impact is great. So these families that are reliant on the industry for feeding their families for, for, you know, um, being at that dinner table and providing, you know, I think it's really come into focus this year. And so for, for us that have the obligation to guide the industry, we must think about the challenge of sustaining the healthy fashion industry in addition to the impact and the challenge with meeting and, and exceeding the goals. And, and they dovetail very nicely. And I think really it comes down to the simple truth. You know, can we in good conscience know that the workers that work in our industry at, at night when they're at the dinner table with their families can feel good about how we are treating their communities, their planet, um, you know, their water, their local water, their local um, biology, and at the same time that we continue to push forward with health in the industry. And so uh, the challenge, I think, uh, is great. However, the imperative is even greater because of what it does to livelihoods and families around the world. So that's a little bit how we think about it. And I think it gives us the, um, the energy and the, the criticality to move forward with you know, aggressive goals on multiple fronts um, in this topic. There, the Fashion Pact has a diverse membership. Um, Paul, are there differences of involvement um, uh, or diversity of issues uh, according to the market segments that these companies represent? Paul, I think you're on mute there. Could you unmute? I apologize. There you go, great, thanks. Uh, Sonia and uh, Mani said it well, we don't compete on the future of humanity. And uh, what you see here is uh, the biggest collective industry coalition across any industry that we was imagine are involved with. We work in the food sector, we work in the finance sector, and we work here in fashion. And having 62 companies together, uh, you see the benefit of first and foremost sharing their best practices with each other and then driving to the highest common denominator. Now, the key here is that you have the total value chain because the issues might be, as Sonia said, labor standards up the value chain, whilst the innovations might happen down the value chain. Um, the luxury companies are in a better position to innovate around sustainability, try new things and set trends than, for example, the mass of the market. So having everybody together and benefit from that collective higher ambition, as well as best practices, is absolutely crucial. What we now need is we have about 30% of the whole market, enough to have a tipping point. We have governments that have come to us, NGOs who want to work with us, innovation 
incubators that think that they can scale collectively with us. So we are starting to see the, the advantages of doing this and driving the systems change that is needed. What we now would recommend is that the companies that are not yet part of the Fashion Pact really seriously consider joining for their own benefit, but also for ensuring that the industry as a whole changes at an accelerated speed. And the world would be so much better for it. The image of the industry would be so much better for it. And the citizens of this world would be so much more grateful for it. Yeah, collaboration and dedication are key. So Bruno, when we look ahead, uh, what are the next steps then for the Fashion Pact? So for me, two big part. The first one, Fashion Pact, I think we need to enlarge and to continue to dig together and to understand uh, new topics. Uh, as you know, there are many. Uh, here we talk about some uh, specific examples of cotton, but there are many others and we need to learn from this experience. We need to decide what are the next topics. We need to measure and set up the right KPIs to understand uh, where we are. A lot to do to the Fashion Pact and again, the best experts to help everyone to understand and to find the right positioning. That on one end. On the other end, uh, I think it, it's also the role of the Fashion Pact is to convince uh, all the signatories that change will happen only in their companies, okay? Here we are talking about very concrete action plan and it's up to each company to decide what are the next step and how to include and how to, to, to make it happen. You know, it's about uh, not only talking about it, it's not only about communicating about it, is how to make it happen and that it's a, a, a big challenge for all of us. On top of that, if I want to take some step back, I, I think that uh, the best to judge our project uh, and our uh, efforts will be our customers. Today, uh, they, they touch, they, they, they buy, they feel uh, products, and these products have uh, to, uh, to include you know, all these new values uh, we are talking about, and that is making a big difference. So for me, uh, being able to invest you know, in the fashion back in this transformation, is obviously a, a way to say that uh, our brands will be uh, still existing in the next 20 years. So it's a key moment, as already mentioned, and we need to be there, we need to be together. We would love to continue to compete, but at the same time, we'll organize these changes and these changes will give a, a better planet, if I may say. Okay, um, I'd like to now open it up to questions from our audience. Uh, we've already got uh, quite a few coming in now. Uh, so let's get to it. We've got here for, uh, from Gaurav, um, how can we collaborate and have, a, have single guidelines for unifying the industry as there are many coalitions or associations working for reducing the impact through uh, with very diverse estimations? Paul, can I ask, ask you to answer that one for us? Well, you know, when there are issues in the world, a thousand flowers bloom. What we're trying to do with this collective is create a bouquet. Because there are so many of these coalitions around climate change, around biodiversity, we usually don't see the step change that we need. We end up with incrementalism. So the beauty of this is that we will have less, bigger and better initiatives. And we, with that, we also, as you can see already after one year, achieve better results faster. We obviously make it totally transparent. We get the best experts in that help us on defining biodiversity for this industry. Nobody's ever done that to help these companies accelerate the move to science-based targets on climate change. Over 40 companies now, more than any other industry. And then every year with a scorecard developed by BCG, with a publication of the results and achievements, with the individual members holding each other accountable, we will communicate on the progress and drive the collective higher and higher. This, I believe, is the future of partnership. This is the future of the industry, and hopefully we'll have more companies join soon as well. We have a question here for you, Bruno. Um, the question is from uh, Fulia. Uh, Chanel has been undertaking a series of acquisitions along their supply chain um, with small businesses. How are these tra transactions sitting within the custom uh, the company's sustainability policy? Yeah, I, I see all these acquisitions are key for the company for the next 20 years. We are not talking about today. Uh, but quite often we are talking about creation, we are talking about unique know-how, 
um, more and more difficult to ensure that uh, all this know-how can continue to exist. So here, we are giving uh, to this uh, small company uh, the opportunity to continue to develop, to continue to work with uh, uh, all the partners. So I'm not talking only one brand, Chanel, is, uh, if I may say, an open uh, uh, business. Uh, and the idea for us is that if we want uh, to continue uh, uh, to be uh, as strong in the next 20 years, we need to ensure that all these people, not only in France, in Italy, but around the world, can continue to exist and can continue uh, to bring uh, their know-how to uh, what we need. Okay. Uh, Sonia, I've got a question here for you. It's from Christian uh, asking, why wait until 2030 to implement these changes? SpaceX launched a rocket into space in as little as 10 years. Could Gap Inc. not eliminate plastic in a much shorter time than that? No, I, I love the challenge, and I think, uh, you know, as we publish uh, our annual uh, sustainability report, these are the challenges and, that we pose to ourselves as well, because we all want to get there as fast as we can. We really do. And so for us, you know, I would say that uh, we will, we're committed to 2030, and we're looking for every opportunity to pull ahead. And, you know, we've got a very passionate employee team and very passionate customers, I think, that will help give us the innovation that is required to make those uh, those changes. And, and we hope to surprise and delight with every year's progress. Uh, Paul, I have a question here for you. It's from uh, Beata. How does uh, the Fashion Pact control and enforce what has been agreed? What are the downsides if targets are not met? Well, they this is a collective of courageous CEOs that has decided to accelerate their company plans. And even despite COVID in the first year, I think they've put their word where their mouth is. And that's very encouraging. The strength of the fashion pact is only as strong as its weakest link. So if there are members that diverge into different directions and are not willing to take these minimal commitments that are needed, uh, one of the absolute commitments as Sonia is saying is for example, to get to the Paris agreements on climate change and to stay below one and a half degrees. So if companies feel for whatever reason that is not their strategy or that it is difficult to achieve for them, then um, they will not longer term be part of a collective that tries to drive the industry for the better. But I yeah. think that those companies that would follow that route would put themselves at risk. Increasingly, we can see that companies that lead on ESG, that are multi-stakeholder, long-term focused, environmental, social, and governance are also the ones that are better performing and actually also the ones that increasingly the financial market is willing to invest in. So everybody would be well advised to be in because many of the things, if you go out, you really can't achieve versus what a collective can do. Uh, one of the interesting questions, I think one of the things that we have been seeing throughout the year, and as I'd mentioned earlier, and, and, and you've all, all, all touched upon is how interconnected uh, we all are and everything that we do, whatever happens in one side of the, the planet is felt on the other side. There have been a range of social issues that have been brought to the surface uh, this year and in the last uh, 16, 18 months even, uh, pre-COVID and obviously within this, this year, of, of COVID and there's a social issues that are impacting um, um, impacting lives, but also our, our planet in terms of, again, climate change, um, biodiversity and, and oceans. What about the social issues that are, when we look at diversity, inclusivity, uh, black, lives, black Lives Matter, gender equality, all of these issues that are extremely important to every company structure how is the Fashion Pact addressing that? And is that on the agenda or is that already in the works? Uh, who, uh, I guess, Bruno, would you like to take that one? What you mentioned, you know, it's a key challenge for all companies. So uh, uh, Fashion Pact uh, is a level of discussion, but uh, not only Fashion Pact. I think that's something that we need to address in each uh, single company, there is no choice. Uh, we need to take care of uh, the people who are working for us anywhere. There is no question about that. Uh, and, and that's the reason why uh, we are quite uh, involved uh, on uh, all these changes. But today, as you can see, the situation is specific, if I may say country per country, and need to be addressed uh, country by country. And, and that's the reason why 
uh, even if we have uh, very high standards for uh, Chanel, uh, I can talk about it. Uh, after we have to enter in the detail, uh, and the situation can be uh, as need to be taken into consideration at, at the highest level of the company. Uh, Manny, how do you ensure that with we have 62 signatories right now within the Fashion Pact? How do you ensure that the those that are part of this pact are actually staying true to what they promised in the first place? I think the key is uh, is transparency. I think is we need to continue to to disclose uh, the information that we're that we've that we've said we were going to drive towards, the goals that we've established, the science-based ta targets, and some of the other targets that we've established for ourselves individually as companies and as part of the collective uh, uh, co uh, fashion pack together. I think if you think about your stakeholders, our consumers, our employees, and Paul touched on it, now even our stockholders are demanding uh, that we be held accountable and that we deliver on the results uh, that, that we've talked about in these science-based targets. Just like we are held accountable for our financial results, driving our earnings, to, uh, earnings per share, driving our sales growth, we, we do that by first and foremost putting ourselves out there, putting, putting goals and objectives out there for each of our companies, and then at the same time, um, driving towards those goals. And do we achieve every goal we're trying to establish? No, but we're moving our companies forward. And we need to do the same thing here with the targets we're setting for ourselves from a diversity, from a, from a biodiversity point of view, from what we see in the, in the environmental issues. And then we've touched on some of the social issues. So all those targets are there. And collectively as an industry holding ourselves uh, accountable for those results will deliver against that and deliver change. And while I still have you here, Manny, do you believe, will, will fashion ever be sustainable? Are these things um, compatible with each other? Uh, yeah, I think so. I believe so. I think it's critical uh, that we, we set that as our goal and we do it in a way that is, uh, that, that has a level of an authenticity and integrity to it, that we, you know, you just don't set goals that sound good from a public relations point of view, but that you know you can deliver against, that you know you can measure against, and then, then you can go and continually show those progr that progress as you go forward. To, to achieve everything that we want to achieve, we're going to need some technical breakthroughs uh, from, a, from, a, from a raw material point of view and a processing point of view. I believe the industry is up to those challenges as we move forward. And no one company can do it by themselves. It needs to be something that's done as an industry that we hold ourselves accountable to do it. And we need to be open to allow uh, other competitors that aren't part of the 62 companies to bring them into the fold to make them part of the journey as we go forward as well. It's also an opportunity, isn't it, for uh, smaller companies, those who have the, the technical uh, know-how, who have that kind of what uh, Prince William was just talking about, those earth shots um, uh, moments that we can have. Uh, it, it's an opportunity to create something that we don't know exists yet or even know how it would exist, but it, it is possible. Um, Sonia, I have a question here for you. It's from Anna. How can the Fashion Pact tackle the systemic issue of uh, overproduction in the industry, which is surely in itself a significant uh, contributor to environmental degradation without even going into the issue of overconsumption at the consumer level? That's a really interesting point there. You know, I think we're seeing the industry shift, you know, all sorts of new business models emerge, whether it is uh, recycling models or circularity or what have you that are pushing on some of these themes. And, you know, certainly it starts with the product right at the beginning, uh, creating the right product at the beginning, all the way through the chain. And then it's really being in support of our customers' needs that are both, uh, you know, I think needs, emotional needs and physical needs for, for clothing. So we, we are paying a lot of attention to the whole value chain. And, you know, quality is, uh, the definition of quality has just shifted. You know, what used to be a quality product now is, has to be a quality and a sustainable product. And I think with that clarity, 
um, you know, the, the, the usage and the end use that our customers requires, it will be better served. And that's how we're thinking about it, as well as connecting to all of the evolving business models that will continue to create this closed loop system uh, with uh, between fashion and the planet that has to uh, has to continue to build and grow. I think what's an interesting part of, of any discussion now as we go forward is that we all, I think everyone recognizes um, the what the ways things were being done before they don't work now. And what we need to focus on is, okay, now what can we do to move forward? Um, Bruno, I, interestingly enough, you've Chanel has taken uh, numerous initiatives to further reduce its uh, emissions by 50%. Um, there is Chanel Mission 1.5 degrees, as well as investments in innovative uh, companies that give Chanel the opportunities to explore materials that don't extract from nature uh, nor harm nature in the processing cycle. What do you think, what do you think um, being part of the Fashion Pact has meant for your company? I, I, I think that uh, all the topics you mentioned, in fact, we have no choice. Uh, we are a key moment. Uh, if we don't react, if we don't appropriate all these topics, if we are not uh, trying to understand with others, and that's the good news of the Fashion Pact, we are not alone. We are talking together, we are learning from our experience. And, and again, we have no choice. That's the moment. We have a few years. few years is perhaps... Uh, too long, but we have a few years, a few years in front of us, and uh, being able to react now to make this changing uh, now, it's the only way to be able to continue and uh, to save uh, this uh, amazing business uh, which is fashion. So for me, uh, we uh, we have to dare, uh, we have uh, to try to imagine what could be in 20 years from now this uh, new option. That's the reason why uh, we, we are investing, uh, but to test, to learn, uh, and, and let's see what happens. Uh, it has been, uh, I believe that the, the past two years have been uh, key in this decision of uh, going ahead. Uh, now we are, we are learning and uh, it's, uh, it's very important for us. It's very important mm -hmm. for our people also. We have one final question. Uh, Paul, I'd like to ask this one for you. Actually, this for you, it's from Vanessa. Um, how do you bring this new mindset of non-competition to such a competitive and conservative industry? She says, I love your words, but I see a lot of difficulty in convincing the industry. Oh, absolutely. And uh, it will be difficult to convince 100%, Vanessa. We don't disagree with this. But here you've seen some great leaders in the fashion industry today on the panel. What we think is that with about 30 or 40% of the industry present, you can actually create tipping points. Uh, the civil society wants to work with you. Governments are getting interested. Technology will be attracted. And it will be so much to the benefit of the companies that are participating. So whilst we realize that ultimately you need the right frameworks or legislation in some of the places, and we're seeing that happening with Europe, with the circular economy packets, for example, or some climate commitments that countries are taking, we believe that we can create a critical mass in every industry. As I mentioned, we're doing it now in food. We're starting to look at it in finance. It's hard work, but I think we're at the point now that we have a good cadre of CEOs that see the importance. One of the examples of this fashion pact is also when COVID came, it went immediately together on PPE material or working like money with PVAs and others uh, initiated with the ILO, the COVID-19 uh, action in the global garment industry dealing with the value chain and health and income and job protection. We've never seen these initiatives. So if you put the right people together, we believe you can create these tipping points that the world needs right now. Being incremental or playing not to lose is simply not an option anymore. Right, on those words, some key words here from this panel discussion, courage, action, uh, no choice, as Bruno had so rightfully said before. I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank my guests, Sonia uh, Segal, Segal the, uh, Manny Chirico, Bruno Pavlovsky, and Paul Pullman. Thank you so much for your uh, words here today and the work that the Fashion Pact is doing. I'd like to thank you all for sending in your questions as well as you join in on this ongoing discussion. I'm Monita Rajpal. Thank you all for watching. Thank you. Thank you, Monita.